uh, the occult, uh, meaning the hidden knowledge that we're not supposed to know, specifically extraterrestrials and what uh, private corporations and in, in the past government may have known. And that extends far, far, far more than what people think. So since I mentioned his name yesterday and you're clearly seeing his name today, as well as a picture I pulled of him. Let me introduce to you, uh, he's also an ancient aliens uh, uh, star or someone who has appeared on that, Gaia. He's got his own sh uh, program and he's also one of the largest social media managers with forbidden knowledge it, with, within this topic. Actually, I don't know anybody else uh, within these conventions or people that we normally acknowledge as being people to know about uh, extraterrestrials, etc. So, that happens to be the one and only Mr. Billy Carson. Mr. Carson, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Now, uh, let's take it back to the beginning. At what point did you realize that uh, we may not be alone and if the evidence that we're not alone has been here on Earth uh, via crashes or ancient civilizations uh, and being covered up. What was the aha moment for you? That was uh, 1977. Uh, I was living, living in Miami, Florida, near the Opelika Airport. I lived in Opelika. It's a subdivision of Miami. And um, Basically, I uh, was out in the backyard. I used to go out in the backyard and watch the airplanes go over. Small private airports, so I just watched the prop jets and the small jets go over, and I would it amazed me how how, uh, how they would move across the horizon. It, you know, from my perspective, it looked like they were moving slow, but obviously they had to be moving hundreds of miles an hour to stay in the air. And so that just really got to me. But one day when I was out there, this object came across the horizon from the same direction as the airport, but it, it wasn't an airplane. I just knew it wasn't an airplane because it didn't have wings, it didn't have a fuselage cockpit or tail. And uh, it cleared the horizon in seconds, not minutes. And that's when I knew I saw something incredible. And then it shot back in the same direction, it stopped, but I can estimate now, probably about two or 300 meters above my head, hovering completely, completely silently, and then took off the way that it came in, in the blink of an eye. And I literally was totally amazed. And I went to the, uh, my, you know, back then there was no Google, there was no uh, cable TV, none of that existed. I had to go to my school and go to the to the library and get the Encyclopedia Britannica. And I started researching aerospace from then. Now, unfortunately, I, is people, for some reason, do not believe that we can expand our laws of physics. For instance, if something is traveling several thousands of miles per hour, then if it's not creating a sonic boom, something is up with that. That means people, especially scientists, and I've had several on the show over the years, who are so hard-headed, they think that this is the universal law. But would you agree that it's you know, we are still learning. I mean, 120 years ago, man flight is was an impossibility. Then comes, of course, the Apollo missions to the moon. Again, things that if you were living in 1895, oh, you are science uh, fiction writer. So I think yeah. more is coming to the forefront. And, and let me ask you this. Why do you think there has been such a... a increase in people's paying attention to these type of topics? Well, we've got a couple of inputs coming in that are really um, opening our eyes and desensitizing us. So we have a lot of TV. I remember when the cable TV man first came to our house in Miami and knocked on the door and said, there's something new coming out called cable TV. This was in the 1980s, early 80s. And uh, we connected from this electric line to your house. And once we got that box, one of the most you know, incredible shows or movies that I watched was The Last Starfighter. 
and so it really opened us up to this idea of space travel and we had flash gordon and all of a sudden that t v that barely picked up any channels i think we had four channels when i was a kid now all of a sudden we had twenty five channels and it was like wow the world opened up and now we're starting to see u f o s alien space ships other planets and over the years more and more people generation after generation have been desensitized to u f o s and aliens and space ships and space travel and space science fiction movies and so now all of a sudden once the military starts coming out you know like with the a tip documents and things like that and the pentagon saying oh yeah we're in possession of vehicles not of this world people are just open to talking about this and really expressing themselves and 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 openly talking about some of the things that have, have you know been a question mark in their head for, you know for years and so it's created an open topic it really is just this soft disclosure that has happened through uh, Hollywood to be honest with you that has made people more open to it now some people say that it was because of movies books comics that I uh, coined the term a little uh, green man or other things like that but I tend to argue the other side which is that movies generally represent what people see do you think that the reason movies like, say, Close Encounters of the Third Kind or uh, uh, anything, uh, E.T. even, is based because of what humanity had seen and experienced over millennia, if not even longer, if that's proven? Uh, or is it, do you think that people are talking about gray aliens because that's what was seen in some blockbuster hit? Like, uh, for instance, it's not gray alien, but I think it's a gray, a green alien in the movie Signs. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the reality is, I mean, as far as you can go back in ancient history, and I'm talking about deep, deep antiquity, you know, if I go into the Sumerian tablets, the Amal tablets, if I go into the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, the Code of Hammurabi, the Enuma Elish, no matter how far back I go, 20, 30, 40, 100, 200,000 years, 400,000 years, I'm still finding people describing UFOs and people coming from space. And every indigenous culture on this planet, prior to the colonization and the conversion into uh, other thought processes, uh, were all believing in these space brothers and star brothers and people coming from space to teach them and describing the craft that they used to arrive in. So we're talking about something that's really embedded into our epigenetic memories and has been passed down from generation to generation through the RNA. And so, yes, Hollywood does give us this soft disclosure, but what it really does, it triggers these ancient memories uh, from our you know, ancient ancestors of what they experienced. And what they experienced was real, and they, and they documented it very, very well that people came here from space and engaged mankind. Now, do you think we are being invaded or is it just because people have more free time uh, well, forced in the last year? Because from what I gather, there are far more videos that uh, we see at Third Phase of Moon. Uh, so many submissions that they have to turn down uh, several just to pick the most uh, the, the ones that have quality and yeah. are, uh, you know, witnesses. But I have a I have a feeling that it's not necessarily because of us staring at the sky and having a, a 4K video camera or smartphone, whatever you want to call it, in your pocket. I am truly starting to see that whatever was being hidden in the past is out more so in the open. So, in, do you think we're being invaded? I think that the invasion had already begun. I, see, I think that what we're seeing is um, that these, uh, these people, these beings, they're making themselves more um, uh, available to see. They're making themselves, you know, seen. And so what their ships do, you know, a lot of people tend to think a lot of these, these beings might be multidimensional. I'm pretty sure there are some multidimensionals, but I think the majority of them just have technology. Human beings can only see 1% of the light spectrum. That's right. So we only get to see the colors of the rainbow, literally. 
but there are animals out there that can see even more than we can see. You know, hummingbirds and insects can see in the ultraviolet. So these beings are very smart. They know that we can't see ultraviolet. We can't see infrared with the naked eye. We can't see multispectrum. So what they do is they shift into gamma ray. They shift into ultraviolet. They shift into the different multispectrum lights that we can't get access to with our naked eyes. So they're there, but they're not there. They hide in plain sight. And I think a lot of what's happened now more recently is they seem to have just switched off and gone into visual mode for human uh, eye range, human vision range. And they're letting us know, like, hey, like, we're here, guys. <laughs> and I think we're being observed, monitored, watched. Um, just like we go out into the Serengeti Desert, we go out into the into the jungles of Brazil and any other nature reserve, uh, preserve, and we... Um, you know, we, we, we watch the animals. We put we hide cameras inside their dens, and we, we watch them being born, and we, we, we then we alien abduct them because we're the aliens. So we, we shoot them with a dart, we knock them out, and then we put a tracking device inside their body, and then we monitor their, their where they go and, and how far they swim in the oceans and all this kind of stuff. The same thing that the aliens are, are doing to us. Now, let's talk about uh, disclosure. I don't know. I don't think it's going to happen. That's my personal opinion. But at the same time, when the DOD uh, released those uh, videos, which actually TTSA was the, uh, the group that, you know, forced the hand in 2017, I started proclaiming this is disclosure. This is as best as we're going to get. Do you think that maybe in, you know, June, the 180 day is going to show us something spectacular and, you know, uh, different craft landing and, and people physically seeing them as opposed to sort of uh, covert when they're doing abductions or contacts? Uh, aside, of course, seeing in the sky uh, different si uh, sizes and shapes of craft. But uh, I don't know if our, the United States government will do anything that it hasn't done already in the past, which is ridicule or release as little as information as possible. One major thing, as you just mentioned, I was talked about with, for, I think, 24 hours, maybe even less. Off-world vehicle, not from this Earth. That was global. But I think it was not even you know, the next day uh, they removed certain key phrases to make it seem like it could be a meteor vehicle. And I, I believe they removed uh, uh, Why do you think that happened? Well, of course, it's uh, confusion, create confusion, hide the truth in plain sight and then make it extremely ambiguous so as to keep it in a very, um, really intelligent way to keep it suppressed at the same time. So we can say that we told you, but at the same time, we're going to cover it up in plain sight and make people think that the ones who are talking and posting and writing about it, that they may be crazy off their mind or something. Um, you know, as far as disclosure goes, hard disclosure is never gonna come because then you would have to admit to the decades of lies but what they will do is uh, we have the, the uh, Perseverance rover on Mars just landed a few weeks ago and Perseverance has the science kits on it and the reason why they put the science kit on it to detect life is because they're going to announce alien life within the next five years using the Perseverance rover to announce alien life and that alien life is going to be in the form of bacteria yeah thank you virus. actually uh, that that would was what I was going to say because I don't think they're going to say hey uh, mm -hmm. by the way we have uh, intelligent beings that are more intelligent than not so you know single celled uh, you know entities but you're absolutely right because there has been methane created on Mars and then it goes away so uh, yes I, I do think it will be bacteria so in your opinion, in June, or let's just say July, when it's after 180 days, do you think that's what's going to be essentially the 
main story as opposed to uh, more pilots, you know, chasing Tic Tacs and gimbals around. Yeah, I don't think they're going to come up with any more pilot stories uh, this soon. I really don't think that this 180 day, my opinion is a 180 day thing is just probably not going to be as, as, as explosive or incredible as people think it is. Um, I don't I think it's just going to putter out, but I think that uh, within the next few years, we'll hear about, you know, bacteria and single, single cell organisms on Mars. Um, but I don't think that this 180, 180 day thing is going to pan out to be anything. Now, let's talk about Antarctica for a moment, or for as, as long as you want. Now, because the ice is melting, uh, and we could, that's a whole different conversation of what it does to the planet, uh, because it's actually not going to be global warming, uh, from what I read in science magazines, journals, etc., is that the, once more ice melts, it's going to cool the oceans and possibly trees. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> no one really says that, and I'm so thankful that you just did. But aside from that, as the ice is melting, aren't anomalous things found? For instance, I heard that a ground penetrating radar actually found a complex structure. And if the ice has been over Antarctica for, I don't know, I don't know how many thousands of years or longer than that, who would have created that and why are they trying to hide it so much? Uh, it reeks to me of, of course, of a conspiracy of some sort, but possibly, would you say that our history is tied to that? And if not, what do you think we're going to find out from Antarctica, assuming we're allowed to go? Right. Well, Antarctica is a very, very amazing place for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, the ice has been over there for 13,000 years, so anything that uh, that we find now is is at least 13,000 years old plus, you know, it's 90 plus. Um, we found a very, very large pyramid which made it onto, my team found this pyramid which made it onto ancient aliens uh, two seasons ago. And there's a complex there, there are geometric structures there underneath the ice, there are some that are gigantic 30, 30 meter openings leading into an area where we have all of the bases, the research bases from every major continent in the world is there, including the Rothschild and Rockefeller, or it's really called the Rockefeller Foundation. They have a base there as well, of course. But uh, yeah, I think that uh, when you look at Antarctica and, the, and a lot of these, uh, forget the structure, let's talk about the actual animals that have been now uh, found with this melting ice when they do an autopsy on the animals they find they find undigested food in their stomachs over and over again so what does this mean this means that antarctica which actually was part of atlantis it was part of the atlantean civilization not just the ring city because the ring city was just one capital of many atlantis was a global civilization i talked about this in my book but what they found with this food in the belly, which means that Atl Antarctica was in a much more tropical location and then extremely rapidly moved into the location that it, it's in now. And these animals in the, in the foliage were all flash frozen. And how can this happen? Well, we have a planet with tectonic plates. And every so many tens of thousands of years, those tectonic plates have a major global slip or a major continental sh uh, slip and when that happens you have a pole shift of the crust of the earth itself so the crust moved into that position within just a few short hours uh, probably creating also a global or a par partly global flood because that kind of movement will create uh, a huge flood around most of the planet uh, and so we have the, the, the fact that there's undigested food in their stomachs is evidence of a pole shift of the crust of the planet itself. Uh, so that was part of the reason why Atlantis sunk and, and, and went underwater because of this pole shift. And as well as, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, the ancient sites, uh, which were highly technological, were covered by ice. Now, like you said, if they have undigested food 
in their uh, bellies, is their stomach. Essentially, that is a, a no-brainer that they were killed fairly quickly, and like you said, in a couple of hours. And another thing, too, is I'm glad you brought up the fact that the uh, circle, uh, or circle within a circle within a circle, part of Atlantis is just the city. It's not the entire, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, continent or or something else. Now, do you think that there was something that happened on Atlantis uh, where people maybe revolted against uh, Nephilim or, or ETs or, or something that caused them? Or is it just natural? Um. I think it's, uh, you know, when you look at some of the ancient texts, part of it seems like allegories. It seems like this war that happened. And this war was a battle between these, the gods. Now, these gods have been called many names. They were called Greek gods. They were called the Netiru, ancient uh, uh, Egypt, or really the land of Kem before it was called Egypt. Um, and so you, you know, and so basically, uh, these these gods, were, they were really related, and they were going against each other, fighting each other for resources and control of humans on the planet. And uh, one of these gods, whose name is Marduk, who made it into the modern-day Bible, he's also known as Amun-Ra uh, in the text, and uh, also Aten, the sun god or the sun disk, which uh, Akhenaten used to worship and you know, came and ushered in monotheism. He wanted to not only take over his kingship of the planet ahead of his processional period time, he started a war to do it. And then, uh, you know, he, he started two pyramid wars, which literally included or involved what we now see, you know, a, lot of, a lot of circumstantial evidence says nuclear type weapons. And some of the evidence can be found in Mohenjo-Daro in the Indus Valley. Uh, of course, the entire swath across Africa, which looks like a desert, if you put your hand in that sand, which I've been there in person, you pull up balls of glass. Uh, and those balls of glass are from 3,000 plus degree temperatures. Wow. Uh, so we have evidence all around the planet of these uh, these nuclear wars, including, like I said, Mohenjo-Daro, the bodies of the dead are still laying in the street holding hands after all these thousands of years. And scavengers haven't even eaten any of the bodies. Then when you go there with a Geiger counter, they're still above the background radiation. It's still higher than background radiation there. So, and the buildings turn into glass. The bricks turn into glass. So we're looking at a war that was started between these beings. And this war not only extended around the planet Earth, it even extended to the moon and all the way to Mars. Now, with regards to Mars, I've heard from uh, multiple people that we originated from there and one of the things they talk about is our circadian rhythm it actually matches closer to mars than earth uh, yes what's your take on that yeah our circadian rhythm for those who don't know is our sleep and wake rhythm cycle of the human body it's um it's a human bio clock basically now mars is a uh, orbits on this axis is a slight tick slower than Earth's. It's around 23 hours. And what they found was that the human circadian rhythm is matched perfectly to Mars versus Earth's, uh, which is very interesting. Now, when you read the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation, or even if you read the Atra Asis Epic, you discover uh, that, uh, that there were these Ijiji working class Anunnaki who came from Mars to Earth to go to war against Enki and Enlil. And the reason why they were going to go to war was because they were tired of doing a lot of labor on Mars. And, uh, uh oh, I complained uh, about not even having any women. Uh, These were the sons of God, but they were all sons of Anu, who, 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 who basically fell from heaven, heaven meaning space. They came from Mars down. Is this why they slept uh, and with when they the, came the, to an agreement? Is this why they slept with the uh, the beautiful woman of Earth? Correct. This is why they did it. They they in the Enuma Elish, which predates the Bible by six thousand years. <laughs> they they take women back after an agreement was made to not have the war, and that they would genetically modify the existing hominid on the planet and put them to work instead. 
They said, okay, fine, we'll give you guys some time to you know, get that, make that happen. But while we, well, we're leaving now, but we're gonna take some of these women with us. So they took women with them. I lost the last part where you said take women with that. You just cut out. They took women to Mars with them. Ah, I see. Now, see, that this is one thing that bewilders me because when the Space Force was announced, well, I don't think it was just created at that time. Personally, I believe that it was just being revealed. Uh, I actually interviewed someone who said that he saw someone in Oahu uh, in that famous base where uh, Edward Snowden was working out of uh, before he took off to Hong Kong. The point was is that going back to I believe 2007 is, is this is when this gentleman told me that they actually had a space force and they were communicating with not just our astronauts that are you know further away than uh, Mars and etc and other things like that but they were also communicating with extraterrestrials uh, which is ironic in the sense that if they were vocalizing communications uh, you know that's sort of new to me because I would think that once you get to that level and your brain is un fully unlocked and you wake up the muscles and you actually have telepathy what good would it really do to have uh, vocal uh, conversations anymore unless you're screaming for help or something like that but, yeah I mean you know when you reach a certain height, when you reach a certain level of consciousness. Now, you have to realize our cousins on this planet who are the homo sapiens or hominids, I'm sorry, before homo sapiens existed, they were smarter than us, spiritually and consciously. They weren't smarter technologically. So before, uh, now the Anunnaki did not create humans. This is a big myth. Nowhere does it say they created us. What they did was they genetically modified the existing hominid and then they bred us. Uh, the existing hominid, which would have been our cousin, our bodies have been found all over the planet. Bigger heads, bigger bodies, stronger. And because of the bigger brain case, probably much more intelligent and probably most likely all DNA was connected, not disconnected. Now we have quote unquote junk DNA. Well, that's not junk. It used to be connected for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that our ancestors had the ability to do telepathy, um, uh, also, uh, uh, you know, telekinesis. Uh, they probably had the ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field. We all have millions of magnetite crystals in our brains right now. We should be able to navigate the Earth via the magnetic field, just like birds and sea turtles and so forth and we can still sense it we don't sense it we, we don't know they sense it they took a person a man they put him inside of a, a laboratory with a giant magnet and connected uh electrodes to his head to pick up the uh, uh the sensory perception of the magnetic field and as the magnet moved around the room the brain was able to sense it he was still totally unaware that he was sensing the magnetic field but we can see on the computer that the brain was but our ancestors were completely aware of it and utilized that to navigate. This is why they didn't need maps, they didn't need GPS, they didn't need any of that. So I think we were more in tune with the resonant frequency of the Earth and with each other. And we, you know, and so when you get to a high level of civilization, and you know, when we, when, it, when we, our DNA reconfigures and gets stronger, and we add more helixes, and we, we elevate our consciousness. Those natural abilities are going to reconfigure in the human avatar body. They will come back, and so you have to you have to think that there's alien races out there that have achieved this and are still maintaining it at this point. Now let's talk about ancient civilizations. Some people say that humanity, uh, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, or even earlier. We existed and something went wrong. Usually we screwed up and we were erased and then another civilization. And from what I'm hearing, I, I, I believe the, the most recent person to relay this information to me 
was letting the moat count. As she said that we have, uh, we are in the third uh, civilization of humanity on this planet. Uh, did you ever hear anything like, like that in the past for you? Um, you broke up at the last part that you said something about civilization on the planet? Yeah, yeah. The, the, I, Linda Moulton Howe is the most recent person to relay information to me from her sources because she doesn't, you know, tell her sources. And even yeah. before that, I've heard, I actually interviewed people that said that our civilization, humanity, right now is not the first time. It's actually... Uh, up to the third time. Yes, and, that's correct. Okay, so and and the you mentioned the flood earlier. The flood, the great flood, is mentioned in literally almost every religious book in, mm -hmm. in history book. And yeah. I, I'm wondering if it's just the same flood at the same time, or was there multiple floods, or yeah, uh, why there were multiple you, floods. Okay. Okay, or I would think too, just the way, uh, well, what mainstream science says, and I have to emphasize mainstream science uh, when I say science because a lot of it is not, uh, a lot of arrogance there, and, and that's the sad part, is when they talk about the uh, last extinction level event with dinosaurs, it was approximately 65, 66 your research were the two prior human civilizations killed off both by flood or by flood uh, well when you look at the historical records and I'm talking about the ancient what the, 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 the records of the ancient people left behind for us you find that um, it appears to be at one point the earth was struck by an asteroid or a comet of some sort uh, now, this created a massive, massive, almost global flood, where, and it didn't kill everybody. Neither one, none of the floods killed everybody. That's another thing that has been misconstrued a little bit. Uh, it even says it in a lot of the more modern religious texts. When I say modern, I'm talking about, you know, the Bible and things like that. Uh, that not everyone died. It even says that, not everyone died. And in ancient texts, for sure, it says not everyone died. Matter of fact, 36,000 years ago, both talked about the fact that the flood wars were residing and the ancient temple was coming up out of the mud. And uh, he says that uh, his father told him to go to the land of the hairy barbarians that were hiding in the caves that had survived the, the rush of the fountains. So there were obviously a lot of people that did survive these different floods that occurred at different time periods. And some of the floods weren't global, some were just regional, like huge regions now, like, you know, maybe a quarter of the Earth. But some of them were almost planetary. Uh, you know, so there's probably three floods that I can detect now, I'm going through a lot of these texts and just judging the time periods that they were. And But still, there were a lot of survivors uh, amongst, now a lot of people did die, but there still were a lot of survivors in each one of those situations. Now, let's switch gears to uh, more proof that's been popping up about the Earth or, or our civilization being uh, advanced, is a, is a good word to use, than what they portrayed as says, oh no, Sumerians and then Egyptians, nothing before that, but we have things like Kobleki I mm -hmm. Can you tell us? Oh, well, I, I think people listening here for me and watching the, the background I have, I would think almost all of them know about Goblek and Tepes. It's uh, multiple guests that have talked about it. Can you uh, refresh people and tell them, and, and for those who may have not heard or know what it is, can you describe what it is and the significance? Sure. Goblek and Tepe is a... Um, a unbelievable archaeological dig site that's located in Turkey. Uh, and uh, it's an amazing place, and I was supposed to be there this last summer, but unfortunately, you know, uh, what happened, so we couldn't go. But I'm going to try to get there this summer for sure. Um, but it's an amazing place in San Lerfa. Uh, you go into San Lerfa, Turkey, and you go to this 
uh, archaeological dig site that spans for quite some ways. It's probably uh, over a mile, to be honest with you. Only one small portion has actually been dug up, and that took about 10 years to do. This is now, you know, in terms of historical evidence, I think there's a lot more older sites, but they're, at least they're saying that this site is at least, you know, 13 to 14,000 years old, which really has pushed mainstream archaeology to the absolute limit because they don't want to really go past 6,000 years for some reason. <laughs> so yeah, I the know. fact that they gave this thing that dating was like, ooh, finally somebody's, you know, waking up a little bit here. I. Uh do you know offhand of anything else that predates that? Because, I mean, that was a game changer for archaeologists. Like you said, I think the 6,000 years comes from the Bible, or maybe they just couldn't find anything uh, beyond like the an Sumerians. It's like an arbitrary number they just threw out. There. Yeah, that yeah, mean. exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's sad, but it, it's true. Uh, do you know of any other? I mean, for instance, uh, yeah. in, in I've heard of the Sphinx, uh, Sphinx being far, far oh, the older. Great Sphinx. My estimate of the Great Sphinx is 36,000 years old. That's my estimate of the Great Sphinx. Wow. Thoth talks about building the uh, the Great Pyramid about 36 plus thousand years ago, and which means he would have built the Sphinx around that same time period. Now, when you look at the what they're saying about the Sphinx, they're trying to say, you know. Uh, three, four thousand years ago. That's a joke. When you look at the weathering of the Sphinx, the actual weathering, now you you know now we know from well, now our great science how weathering works and what it does to different types of sandstone and rock. So we can actually judge the time period of the weathering, and we can say, okay, this level of weathering would be it would take this many quote unquote thousands of years based off of how many inches of rainfall per year. So it's not like, it's not even rocket science anymore. This is like basic, basic, basic science. So the fact that they keep throwing out these fake numbers just makes me laugh. And, you know, people don't don't know, so they just, they, they take it. But when you look at the, the weathering, some other alternative archaeologists are trying to say, you know, right around the time of the last ice age, 13,000 years, or the time of Gobekli Tepe. But I tend to think that wasn't even a good era for building of the Sphinx. And when you look at the weathering, it seems to be much older. Now, what's interesting is, if you go back two processional periods, you end up around 36,000 years, around the same time that Thoth claims to have built the Great Pyramid, and it matches perfectly with the construction of the Great Pyramid, if those tablets are accurate. So, I tend to think that the Great Sphinx is probably more likely around 36,000 years old, uh, maybe even you know, a little bit older than that, but that's the time frame that I think would have been the perfect time for that structure to be constructed. And there was a second Sphinx out there on Giza as well. Mm -hmm. That second Sphinx was actually destroyed, but the uh, the base of it was discovered, the trimming and the base of where it was located across, right across from the other Sphinx was found. Sphinx is very rarely are built in, in single, you know, usually in pairs. Uh, now, yeah, the actual Sphinx, I believe it is a lion with a, uh, a lion head with a dog body. Is that what's, uh, what's accepted these days? No. Or? Yeah, no, the, the Great Sphinx, that's what they're trying to say, yes, it was, it was a lion, and that's why the head that's on there now is uh, is not the right size, but that's actually inaccurate. If you go into the uh, Sumerian tablets, you discover that uh, Enki ordered his son, Thoth, to, in, in the tablets, he's called Ningzida. So he tells Ningzida to put his face, to build a lion facing the constellation of Leo and to put his face on it. And so, originally it was Thoth's face, T-H-O-T-H. -H, also known as Negazita. Uh, he's also known as Tehuti, Tehuti. He has many names. But him and his brother, Thoth and his brother, were, were at odds a lot and uh, even had a couple of battles. And um, so Enki tells Thoth, you know, go over to the other side. Go to Mesoamerica, you know, kickstart a civilization over there. And, uh, you know, and so when, he, when his brother was given the kingship over that area, his brother recarved Thoth's face from the Sphinx and put his son's face over it. It's actually Thoth's nephew who's the face of the Sphinx, and that's why it's a much smaller head for the body. It was recarved from another uh, humanoid type face to, to that humanoid face. It was never a lion according to the ancient Sumerian tablets. Speaking of the Egypt and the Egyptian area, I, let me ask you this. Why pyramids? Because they're not just there. I mean, obviously, the 
uh, Valley of the Kings and the Great Pyramid of Giza is the most famous, but we see them everywhere, whether they be step pyramids, like for instance in South America, and I'm going to uh, blow a bombshell here that no one knows outside of two friends of mine, that they just discovered a pyramid in Hawaii on the main island, on the big island, and uh, hopefully that'll be archaeologists will converge there at some point. Mm -hmm. But this shows that people who supposedly had no contact with each other all were building these pyramids. Yeah. In your opinion, why that shape? Okay, well, a couple reasons. Let me first tell you why they all have pyramids. They all have pyramids because they were given the, the, um, the architectural plans from Thoth, the Atlantic. He's the one who gave the order to build the pyramids, and he sent his crew and team around the planet to do so. You can read that in the Emerald Tablets. You can even find that online. So the Emerald Tablets, uh, once he kickstart civilization after the Great Flood in the land of Kem, he tells his crew, he says, spread out around the planet and duplicate what we've, what we've done here. This is why you find pyramids all over the planet. Now, the, the pyramid structure itself, it harnesses energy. So the pyramids have are multifunctional stone computers and communication devices and also even energy and power generators. The Great Pyramid, for example, at Giza, it has a, it's a multifunctional stone computer and communications device. It was built on top of an aquifer. At the time that it was built, the Nile ran right up alongside of Giza, right up alongside the plateau where the pyramids are located. Now it has meandered uh, a lot more way off due to damming and everything else that was done. And so those aquifer and uh, areas underneath the Great Pyramid are dried up tubes now. You can actually walk down there where the water used to flow. But when the water used to flow underneath that which was granite, it, it would create physiostatic electricity. And that physiostatic electricity would create ions that would then flow up, flood up into uh, the Queen's Chamber. The Queen's Chamber would then was a, um, a hydrogen uh, filter. It would literally extract the hydrogen atoms and then shoot those up through those shafts that were openings on the side of the pyramid that are still there. There was a pointed at star systems, Orion, Aldebaran, and so forth, Sirius, because they would send communications on the hydrogen frequency, the same way we do now in our science laboratories, NASA and the European Space Agency. Uh, we send out communications on the hydrogen frequency into deep space trying to find, if, uh, if, see if there's anybody home out there, some, somebody's going to answer us back. Because hydrogen is the most widely used frequency, scientists estimate, uh, astrophysicists estimate, uh, you know, in the universe. So they, they use that in the ancient past. Uh, the rest of those ions would flood up the Grand Gallery, which used to have resonating uh, bars in there. Those slots for those resonating bars have been, the, the bars have been removed, but the slots are still there where they used to where they used to reside. Up the Grand Gallery into the King's Chamber, where it then would be magnified by all the crystal granite in there. And then it would shoot up through the apex, and it would then send out this wireless electricity, which would be picked up by the obelisks. The obelisks are all crystal granite. They receive that wireless electricity, harness it, and then the uh, Egyptians would have something called a jet pillar in their hands. It's very reminiscent of a Tesla coil uh, inside of a uh, an object that looks kind of like an onk with a tube coming out of it. That tube was actually a wire that would connect to light bulbs and such. And that's how come you won't find any soot inside of any of the tombs, any of the uh, crypts in Egypt. The reason why there's no soot in the ceilings or the roofs and all that elaborate painting and, 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 and glyphing that they did was because they had powered light. They didn't have to use uh, torches. What uh, comes to mind this. is Baghdad batteries. You yes. know, and and mm -hmm. for people to uh, say, oh, these are just pottery. Well, why the copper wire and the uh, citrus uh, fruit, whether it be, I, I yeah. believe it's lemon. <clears throat> Somebody had to know something. Oh, yeah, they knew. Yeah. The back that batteries were used for electro gold plating so that, you know it didn't have enough power to do too much more but you can gold plate and gold plating was huge in ancient Egypt uh, so the, that's what the Baghdad bags were used for gold plating 
I got a couple other topics because I know we're on a time crunch and then I have some questions from the chat. Uh, so anybody in the chat, if I missed your question because it's too far past, please uh, copy and paste it and rewrite it when I say we're going to take questions. I see uh, Pyramid7 has one and by the way, thank you Pyramid uh, for your super chat. I will say that again. So uh, start piling them up. In your opinion, Mr. Carson, do you think that we have the ability to travel on more dimensions? Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the, you know, I own a tech company called First Class Space, and uh, with First Class Space, I get to go to the Space Symposium, which gives me uh, approved top secret access the last couple of years into the private space room at the symposium and so with TS clearance in private space you get to learn a lot of things I'm in the room with you know the big wigs and what's interesting is um, <laughs> what I can tell you is that whatever you could think of definitely has already been done and we're, there are, we used to say that the government and other black budget agencies were about 50 to 80 years ahead of the general population that is no longer true it's more like 300 years ahead now what? And so time travel can be done uh, simply by even using lasers. And so you can use lasers and you can, uh, you can create with, with enough vortex, you create a laser vortex first of all. So it's not lasers in a straight beam. They're actually angled in a vortex from the top of the device going down towards the bottom, which creates a loop in space time. It's a special type of a laser. And then what you do is you piggyback bits of data, zeros and ones, on that uh, on that vortex, and you can actually send data back in time. And we know this for a fact now. So going back in time is uh, is not that difficult. Going forward in time requires you obtaining a percentage of the speed of light in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so you would need to be on a ship that's moving, uh, that's obtaining a percentage of the speed of light or better able to travel forward in time uh, now when you get on a rocket ship and travel to the moon or you get on an airplane you're traveling somewhere you're you're gain you you actually are traveling in time by very very minute amounts i mean extremely extremely small amounts but you are moving ahead in time based on you know the perception of somebody that's actually standing on the ground so we know time traveling to the future based off of acceleration is a fact as well so time travel is real it's just a matter of developing the technology to make it uh, a possibility. And there has to be some kind of rules and laws against this because time travel can also be extremely detrimental and can cause a lot of problems, obviously, for somebody who was able to do it. Now, one thing, though, is I think when you travel back in time, you have the grandfather paradox. Yes, you thank you. I was just going to ask you about that. Yeah. Now, here's what I think actually happens is when you travel back in time, because we live in a multiverse, there's a frequency shift of going back in time. And that frequency shift puts you in a different universe. So you can go back in time and you can kill your grandfather because uh, you're going back in time on a different timeline. I think once you shift back in time, going backwards, you shift timelines. And that's why you can kill your grandfather. It's essentially because we're going through different timelines. And uh, I, do, have you ever heard of Dan Burch? Oh, J Dad, no, I haven't heard that name. Uh, he supposedly worked at S4 uh, I think a decade and a half after Bob Lazar. Uh, the point being was is he was a, a, a biologist and he was working with this called uh, J-Rod. That was the nickname for an ET. And oh, he's... yeah, J-Rod. Yeah. yeah, okay. And he yeah. said that, sure, that J-Rod, his whole planet is Zeta Reticula, uh, but he is human. It's just, a, a, you know, there are multiple timelines. So, for instance, when they had, like, a group meetings, it could be the same species, Homo sapien, and, of course, evolving, and uh, even the Nordic type beings, but 
because they're in different timelines, they could all be in the same area for a so-called summit and uh, nothing like the grandfather paradox would come into play, which actually is something that really boggles anyone's mind. It's like, yeah. wait a minute, I can take a time machine, go back, kill my grandfather, and I'm still alive? How would that work? But right. clearly, obviously, uh, it doesn't work. It sounds to me like a 1930s or 40s comic is what the grandfather paradox is. Anyhow. Yeah. Now, another important thing I wanted to ask you about is consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, I've noticed that a lot of people who were nuts and bolts of UFOs or uh, cryptozoology, um, uh, Bigfoot even, or anything, essentially has now realized that consciousness is one of the most, if not the most important thing that we have to be looking at. What's your take on consciousness? Well, well, the you know the main reason why I do what I do in terms of uh, working in this conscious community and and doing all these interviews and shows and networks and everything else is because I believe that consciousness is the utmost important thing uh, because there is only consciousness consciousness that exists. There's nothing else that actually ex exists here. I think that um, we all are the, coming from the one same consciousness and that uh, we are just all slightly tuned frequencies of that one. Just like there's a radio station in your city that broadcasts out 99.1, 99.2, 99.3, but all those frequencies are coming from the same source. And so that's the way that, in my opinion, that it works. And I really believe that it's, it's, um, it's our duty for people that have kind of woken up or become awakened to a certain level. Nobody, we haven't all you know, come to the top yet. But, including myself, but if we can begin to help wake up other people and help, help them realize that they are all, we are all one, that there is only one consciousness, that separation is an illusion, uh, then we can start to drop some of these programmed facades like race and religion and, and politics and things like that. We can just begin to just love one another, have unconditional love for one another, really embrace one another and push together, strive forward as a, as a unified uh, you know, human race. Because if you travel from Earth to another planet that's inhabited, and you pop off your helmet and you start talking to the people there, and they say, well, where are you from? You're not gonna say, I'm from America, I'm from Mexico, I'm from you know, Spain. You're gonna say, I'm from Earth. And you know, I'm part of the human race. That's, that's, how, it, that's how it most likely logically can be stated. And so we just have to come to that point where we realize, man, that we are really all one. And, and, and that when I'm talking to you, I'm actually talking to myself. And when you're talking to me, you're talking to yourself because there is only one consciousness. It's just like a scientist, the body, the avatar body of a scientist is made up of billions of atoms. And But a scientist will look through an electron microscope to look at an atom. So a scientist is nothing but billions of atoms analyzing itself. Great, great answer. I, I honestly, one of the, the best, actually, not one of, but the best answer I've heard. Because we are all one. I, you know, the differences between us are so minute. I mean, chimps look so differently. I mean, yes, they're by But even they, I believe it's like almost 99% is identical to the DNA of ours. So, humans to humans, I, I, I don't think there is much difference at all, uh, if anything. Okay, uh, let me get, uh, since we're, I know I start a little late, and I know I can have a lot of things. Uh, first of all, let me give a shout out to my super chatters today. I want to thank uh, Alex Oyen and Rockstar and Pyramid7. I want to thank you all because you are uh, giving me support and keeping me from practicing law in court, which I hate. So uh, I appreciate that. Now, let's get to some of these questions. And I'm going to start with the, um, the first question that I'm able to see. It's one of three. I believe it, yeah, this is from Pyramid 7. And if anyone had a question written before that, please copy and paste it in caps or rewrite it in caps because we don't have much time. So I'm gonna read it word for word, and here it goes. 
Does he believe that Epstein and Elaine were helping discover hidden civilizations, specifically near Cuba, helping Castro or Castro or Castro requested their help? What's your take on that? Uh, no, I don't believe in that at all. There is, however, a pyramid complex right off the coast of Cuba. There's also another one in the center of the Pacific Triangle right off the coast of Florida. And those pyramid uh, complexes are actually well documented and have been taken uh, photos of them via, you know, side scan radar and, uh, and radar from boats. Uh, so, and there were divers that even went down. There's actually even a documentary that came out in the 19, late 1980s about this uh, on mainstream TV. But that, you know, I have a copy of that documentary on Forbidden Knowledge TV. And History Channel actually did a special on one of those pyramid uh, complexes down there. I don't think it's just Lane Maxwell and the other guy. I've never seen it anything to do or, or has anything. I think they were totally focused on something totally different. Blackmail. Um, <laughs> that's yeah, what I you think. Know, that's all they did was record conversations and videotape people and, and use it as blackmail to stay rich. Um, but the fact that those things are down there. Now, what's very interesting, real quickly, is if you take a line, if you go to the center of the Bermuda Triangle and you go down there, you'll find a pyramid down there. And if you go a straight line from the Bermuda Triangle straight through the Earth to the other side, you come out at the Dragon's Triangle with the Yonaguni Pyramid underwater there in Japan, which can be dove to right now. And also the same mystery, you know, mysterious uh, disappearances and everything else at the Yonaguni Pyramid site at the Dragon's Triangle on the other side of the planet. Straight line through the Earth, you end up there. No coincidence. I also heard on top of the uh, the triangle, the two triangles, is an uh, underwater pyramid uh, near Alaska and also on the east uh, or northeast coast, I guess you could say, of Canada. Have you heard of those two? Yeah, I've heard of those two as well. There's actually a lot more being discovered, more and more. So. You know, even under the sands of Giza, they found, you know, 200 pyramids buried underneath the sand right now over there. But there's, so there's pyramids literally everywhere. Off, the, off a lot of the coastlines, you'll find pyramid structures, uh, and they're literally everywhere. This planet was riddled with pyramids. It's just really incredible. Uh, now, I'm going to ask my question before I jump to the next one. Is it your opinion that the pyramids were made by... Uh, non-terrestrial uh, beings, or were they made by Homo sapiens, but by being taught how to make them by ETs? Yeah, initially they were made by the uh, these Atlantean Anunnaki people, and so, uh, but after the Great Flood, and order was made, and this is you, know, you can read the Sumerian Kings list, which is in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England. After the Great Flood kingship was handed down to man and so what they would do is they would create a pharaoh or a king and they would be there would be the liaison between these Anunnaki Atlanteans and the people and so at that point which they were they were taught in the techniques of pyramid building and megalithic structure building under the guidance of some of these uh, these Anunnaki Atlantean people so initially it was done strictly by the extraterrestrials and then much later, after the at least one of the great floods uh, that destroyed that region of the planet, it was handed down to man to do that work under the guidance and, and instruction of these beings. A great, great answer. And uh, honestly, I think that's the best one in the logical that I've ever heard. Because usually people tend to side one or the other, not least that, both. Okay. This next one, Lasha Senya. Have the ancient civilizations left us other records than pyramids, stone tablets, or drawings, or anything? If not, why not? They took the trouble to make pyramids? Yeah, we have a lot of evidence of these ancient cultures. We have uh, cylinder scrolls. These are in the British Museum and the Australian Museum. Uh, we had a lot of great stuff in the Iraq Museum until the U.S. government went there. Um, Both times. <laughs> yeah, or actually, just, we drove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually heard a uh, possible Stargate uh, was taken 
I yeah, when they when they got there, now my friend was at the site of the Ziggurat of Her, and I have pictures of, of that, uh, him and the military's soldiers there on my Anunnaki History Facebook group online. Uh, so he was there, and uh, at the Ziggurat of Ur, after they got done wrecking the, the, the museum, Saddam's museum, and stealing all the evidence of ancient technology and stealing those scrolls and, and tablets, they then went to the Ziggurat of Ur, and they went inside, and uh, they took out this object, which looked like something very reminiscent of the Stargate from the movie Stargate. A giant stone-looking disc with all these crazy inscriptions on it, he said they carried it out, they put it on the back of a double-wide Humvee, military Humvee, put a tarp over it, and he said they drove off and he never saw it again. And so, you know, but uh, it's really amazing. So the WMD, or the Weapon of Mass Destruction, may have been this, that they were after, may have been this Stargate. And because obviously you wouldn't want your, your opponents or your, you know, people to, to activate this thing or figure out how to activate it, and who knows what can come through. So. They got their hands on it, and wherever it's located now, I'm pretty sure they're probably experimenting with this thing. But I would say that would be a global mission to take down a Stargate that we don't know what's on the other side. I sure would want somebody to activate that thing because we don't know what would happen. Uh, so I think that's what they went over there and got. They got that Stargate, and they stole all the evidence of technology at that museum. And what happened was the Minister of Transportation of Iraq in 2015, I believe it was, 2015 or 2016, he went on national TV and said that this is the cradle of civilization and Iraq was the first place of, in ancient times, of advanced airports and rocket ships. And uh, everybody thought he was crazy, but he came out and made that official statement and said that this is where they were, the Anunnaki, basically, this is where we did it. They had all the spaceships, they had all the airplanes right here. Their first airports were right here in Iraq. I, I be, again, I'm going to break from one of their questions to ask uh, one of my questions. Do you think now, today, 2021, this year, that we have uh, human looking ETs walking amongst us? Absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind. Matter of fact, several uh, former NATO um, officers. Uh, have come forward and uh, you know spoken on this. One of them, re more, more recently, he died, but uh, he, he had NATO cosmic top clearance. Cosmic is higher than above top secret. And uh, he says that- Wait, you can Ro be Robert next. Dean? Robert Dean? Robert Dean. Yeah, yeah. Robert Dean. one of my first yeah. interviews, great. Rest yeah. in peace, Robert Dean. Um, yeah, his son still works at the Pentagon now, okay? Uh, but, you know, obviously he's gone, unfortunately, but he came out before he died and uh, he said that they could be sitting next to you in a movie theater, on an airplane. You wouldn't even know that they were not homo sapien sapien. You know what? I, I'm not surprised. Timothy Good actually uh, wrote in his most recent book and described in detail when I had him on last. I literally having two ETs in the different times uh, that looked human and he thought something was off and he essentially said in his mind if you are who I think you are take your left hand and touch your right side of the nostril opposite something like that sure enough that mm. being did so while on stage and then looked directly at him so I oh, tend wow. to agree and then of course David Jacobs uh, not, knock on wood, a uh, poor guy cannot do any of these anymore for some um, health issues, but his most recent book was Walk Amongst Us. Okay, let me get to the last ones because I know we're on a time crunch here. Okay, this one is, it's, it's more of a generalized question because it was written about 15 minutes ago. This is from Rockstar. Who is educated with the no with this knowledge, and how do they keep it hidden? Great question. Uh, the 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 elites are educated. First of all, we're talking about Rockefeller, Rothschild, their entire bloodlines. You know, the the, the bloodline that owns all the central banking systems around the entire planet. They're well well educated on this information. Matter of fact, there have been statements from the Rothschilds stay, s saying that. Um, you know, they, they are born to rule over us. They actually really truly believe that. <laughs> uh, 
because you know their bloodline can be traced back to some of the Sumerian kings. Um, and then, you know, you, of course, you have the major governments of the world. Of course, uh, the military-industrial complex run out of America, and then the European military. They're well, and Russia. They're they they're well versed on this information. They're well researched. Uh, the scientists that are behind the scenes in some of these tucked away, you know, laboratories, you know, like. Uh, well, you used to have Area 51. Now it's moved to Area 52. Area 52 is nearby. You can get through, to a, through an underground tunnel. There's nothing really too much more left at Area 51 anymore. But you have these scientists down there that are working on these projects, researching these tablets, going over these ancient texts, and trying to duplicate these experiments and different scientific achievements from the ancient past. So they're well aware of it. And the reason why they don't want every single person knowing about this and getting this information and learning about all this ancient technology, there's several reasons. The first reason is the religious system will collapse in minutes. If the religious system just in only America is worth over uh, more money than all the uh, tech companies in Silicon Valley, Valley combined. We're talking about over $1 trillion uh, a year. And so we have that devil collapse. That's a huge money pin machine. Then the second reason is all of a sudden you're going to have people demanding access to this technology. We're going to want free energy. We're going to want anti-gravity. We're going to want all these things to make our lives better. We're just going to disrupt current economic systems and take the money out of their pocket because they haven't figured out that you can still have every the other way and still be wealthy. They, they haven't figured that part out yet because they're not that. And they're smart in some ways, but in other ways they're dumb. And then yeah. the other, and then the other reason is because um, security, global security. Uh, if I know how, all of a sudden, I know how to make a, uh, a, an anti-gravity ferrofluid vortex engine and put it inside of a ship and take off, and I can, I can leave this planet. I can, uh, I can fly into a secure area undetected now, and I can, I can, uh, you know, steal things. I may even. You know, try to steal a nuke. I mean, who knows? So there's a there's a global security issue with having access, freely having access to advanced technology. And no matter how far back you go in time and any text you read, when uh, civilization had advanced tech, they would always keep it top secret. This is nothing new, and that's because people will you know you know, take advantage of it. Uh, so those are the three top reasons. I this question that I'm about to ask we essentially. Covered. I'm gonna ask it anyway, but it can just be a yes or no uh, for you since you mentioned. Okay, Don Harrison says, "Does Billy believe that the Desert Storm War was about retrieval of ancient relics and possible stargates from an alien civilization?" That's what we talked about. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. That's exactly what it was about. That was a WMD. Was the weapon of mass destruction was. Potentially a Stargate. Fortunately, I had a friend of mine, you know, that uh, was there, which is great because that gave me more uh, verification and validation of my theory. And um, you know, I posted those pictures up on uh, on my, my group. But um, and then, of course, the fact that it was well documented that we went and stormed into the museum and blew open the doors to the basement where there were the the majority of the most like incredible relics were located and stole those literally stole them so uh that's what it was about okay another one from lasha said yet does he think that the government is looking for the dna of people from before the flood i.e giants dna so they can clone super soldiers that's a great uh, question actually i don't think they want to clone the super soldiers I think what you want to do is you take the uh, well you make you, you need to make one clone but what you do is you try to find out different aspects of their super strength uh, their bone density you try to find out what types of resiliency they had to different types of viruses or illnesses or diseases or injuries and then you just do gene editing into existing people and and, and breed that same uh, exact um, those abilities into existing soldiers uh, so that's kind of what they're into. Uh, last question from the chat, and uh, we'll get to wrap up. Uh, for, again, from Lasha. Is Gobleki Tepe a Stargate? Another great question. Gobleki Tepe, Tepe uh, is possibly a Stargate and a time portal. 
if you look at the stone pillars you see dinosaurs on the stone pillars with meat on their bones you see animals that you some animals don't even recognize where they're from uh, on this planet and then you see some animals that are from different regions of the planet all together and so i think that uh, it's possible that it's a, a portal to transfer from place to place at a rapid play, uh, rapid speed and also possibly it could have been um, a location of some type of a time machine Unfortunately, because of the time, I I know me and you can go on for hours, so next time we'll shoot again, and hopefully it'll be on video, that, which was planned, unfortunately didn't happen. Now, where can people find you? Uh, Gaia, Ancient yes, Aliens. Yes, please look me up on 4BiddenKnowledge.com with the number 4, 4B-I-D-D-E-N, knowledge, 4BiddenKnowledge.com. Uh, you can also find me on Forbidden Knowledge TV. So if you have Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, or your iOS or App Store, just type in Forbidden Knowledge TV, and my TV app will pop up. I have over 3,000 shows, documentaries, and, uh, and, and movies up there that are all based on conscious content, what we're talking about today. Uh, and, um, of course, you can find me on Gaia. I'm also on the Travel Channel. Uh, right now on three shows. I'm on the History Channel, the Discovery Channel on two shows, and the Science Channel on one show as well. I, you're definitely getting the word out there, and it's needed because people need to be informed, and I'm so happy that the last Gallup poll, I, I think I, it was 68% or something like that, that people around the globe now believe that we are not alone. And not to mention all the other topics. Uh, let yeah. me uh, say a few things for everybody out there. If this is your first time, please make sure you subscribe and share. Also write a comment. I read them all and I do my best to reply to every single one. I, although there are a ton, I do my best to respond to all of them. And that is me, not my team. That's and also, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up. All those things help. And one more time, I want to thank my super chatters. I've, I've, I've decided to start waiting for the questions and super chats to the end. That way, I can get the unedited interview of me and the guest, you know, for the most part. And then I'll leave the last 25% or so for so the people out there listen. So. Alex Owen, thank you. Rockstar, super thank you. And Pyramid7, also super thank you. And Alex again, super thank you. He did too. So I'm going to thank you all for keeping this alive and getting the truth out there. Now, with that being said, before I sign off, I'm going to give Mr. Carson the last word. If you have one final statement for everybody, what would it be? My last and final statement is, all of us, including me, we need to continue our research and investigation into the ancient past, into the UFO phenomena, into paranormal activity, into spirituality, which links to quantum physics and is part of the unseen world that could be part of the, the, the paranormal activity. We need to continue to activity. We need to continue to The jungles of our world have long been a centre of many mysteries. Its vast expanse and hazardous undergrowth leaves many to wonder what exactly lies at the heart of that tangle of vines. Occasionally, discoveries are made that answer some of these questions, while others only leave us with even more uncertain puzzles. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three interesting jungle discoveries and mysteries. The Mystery of the Bidenops Over a century ago, Belgian colonizers found a large primate skull during their rampage in the northern Congo. The locals would tell them stories of mysterious large apes that would attack and eat lions. Gorillas were never before found in this region of northern Congo, 
so researchers and explorers were confused and intrigued. They believed it to be an entirely new species of ape, although they never found any additional evidence or proof of life. The skull was promptly left to collect dust in the Royal Museum for Central Africa in Belgium until the 1990s, when Karl Amann read about them in a scientific article. He was a Swiss-born photographer and devoted conservationist. Enraptured by the skull's puzzle, he set off on an adventure through the dense jungles that few had traversed before. The Biliuli tropical forest covers 12,000 square miles and is a mix of impenetrable canopy and large stretches of savanna. The researchers had to trek through an impenetrable underbrush full of ants, mosquitoes and bees that were drawn to their sweat. Despite being such a difficult undertaking, a man ended up repeatedly visiting the forest over the span of 10 years, with various rangers, camera crew and primatologists trying to find the elusive Billy Apes. On his first trip, he found another ape skull, which only increased his obsession. In 2004, American primatologist Cleve Hicks joined the search. He spent weeks traversing through the forest, trying to find the apes. He and his team set up motion-detecting cameras and eventually captured images of the elusive Billy Apes. As it turns out, they were not a new species. They were chimpanzees. However, they were unlike any chimpanzees the researchers had seen before. They had larger skulls and feet than other chimpanzees. Their behaviour was unique in that they nested on the ground like gorillas instead of in the canopy.